Welcome back everyone, live coverage for VMware Explore, almost said VMworld again, second year in a row, Dave. 13th year covering VMware's flagship event. Been an honor um, to do that. And as the chapter closes on the, on the historic run of VMware and the next chapter emerges, we're super excited to continue to bring the reporting and the coverage to the community. And our next guest has been a big friend of theCUBE and a great guest and CUBE alumni. Raghu Raghuram, thanks for coming on. CEO, now the CEO running the show, big man on stage, Dave. All the questions right here. Yeah, it's always answer. great to have you, man. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, thank you, and thank you for covering us for so many years. Like you said, a great, uh, uh, I really enjoy your show and uh, your writings. Raghu, you have been a good friend of theCUBE before you were CEO, you always in the hallway, always chatting, yeah. very transparent, very community oriented, love that. But we always talk tech. Yes. Remember when you guys went to the cloud with AWS, yeah, that was yeah. a fun moment. But there was a time in VMware's history where virtualization was under threat. I remember, I remember Hyper-V was free. It's like, oh my God, that's our core business. And then next thing you know, you got HCI, you got vSAN, you got historic pivots. Yes. V VMware's going to be dead next year. It's always that case. It's just never, the, the, the team has done such a great job. And now as you guys put this next multi-cloud vision together, AI steps up and gives you a gift. Yes. <laughs> Take us through how AI has completely given you a tailwind on an already good strategy that you put in place a few years ago. Yeah, I mean, look, our multi-cloud phenomenon, and by the way, even the previous deployments, they did not just come out of the woodwork, right? We saw, we always look at two extremes. One is, what are the engineers geeking out about? Second is, what are the customers trying to do but are not getting done, right? And we saw this multi-cloud phenomenon fairly early, which is because they were all saying, okay, hey, I'm going to put this here, I bought this company, that company's over there. I got my on-prem. So we said, look, there's going to be a bunch of problems with this, we are going to solve it, right? And then with AI, we are seeing the exact same thing. I mean, it makes perfect sense that you would take all of your data, if you're a smaller company, and put it all in the cloud, and then do your AI there. But that's going to take a long, long, long time for any enterprise of any magnitude, because it's that data spread out all over. So what you got to be thinking about is how do I bring the compute and the model to the data, not the other way around all the time, right? And once you think about that, it's a multi-cloud problem. That is exactly how we came about it. So. In, the, in the briefings we had, the analyst briefings, we heard Chris Wolf or Amanda, I forget who said it, we're good at I.O. Yeah. And so that's also a factor in huge, AI. Huge, the, huge. The, all the costs right now are GPU based, which is a lot of IO and stuff going on and transferring around. Why is that important nuance that people should talk more about? Yeah, so if you look at the systems costs, I mean, let's keep aside the data scientists and all those things for a second. But if you look at what goes into an AI system, clearly there is GPUs, and by the way, it's multiple GPUs in a single box. And it's communication between those GPUs and it's the pathways from the storage into the GPUs, because these AI computations need a lot of bandwidth, right, and need a lot of data. And then you say, look, most of these workloads are going to run in a cluster of multiple servers. So all of that is expensive networking technology, it's complicated storage technology, and it's complicated GPU sharing technology. That's where we excel, and that's where we save people a ton of money because we found better ways to do all of those things. And it's not a scale game either. I mean, scale to the point, not like hyperscale. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do a lot in these clusters. Exactly. So here is the thing that people don't understand. If you have a smaller model, but you're willing to train for a little longer, and if you have very good data, meaning domain-specific data, your accuracy can be really as good as the larger models, and you're going to be a lot cheaper. So, so that is really the secret sauce here. Yeah, very domain specific. We, we, John and I did a power law. Uh, on, we basically had the consumer stuff. You yeah. know, the very, very few large ones, but then yeah. a lot of long tail, yep, exactly. domain industry specific. I wanted to ask you on your keynote, I, I was struck, you had the waves, and we've seen the waves before, but you had a little twist on them. You said basically, we started with a PC, it delivered 100x improvement in price performance, then the web, you, another 100, Mobile was 100x in the app experience, and then Gen AI. He, you missed, expect, he, he missed uh, the cloud with apps. Cloud well, but that was well, I mean, uh, but that was web, mobile. Oh, mobile okay. right? It was yeah. web and mobile, <laughs> but because other, otherwise you really wouldn't have seen. I mean, what would have what would that have been? Some IT savings, right? Yeah. Okay, but so Gen AI, you're expecting another 100x in in. We, are we talking about like human productivity, not 100x in human productivity, but I mean, maybe. But it's, it's going to be that type of 
wave yeah. that's coming. Yeah. I wonder if you could double click on that. No, no, absolutely. So if you think about all of our daily lives, right? What is the thing that's really hard, that characterizes some of the hardest things we do as humans? It is things that involve a lot of creativity, right? And I don't mean just uh, um, artistic creativity, right? Which is phenomenally hard, but also everyday creativity needed for all of our businesses to run, right? Knowledge creation, knowledge consumption, distilling things, summarizing things, bringing the right information to the point of decision making. All those things require a lot of, a lot of, a lot of effort. And that is where I would see the 100x improvement. Mm. Because lots of those things are not necessarily things that is going to require a lot of computer science, right? So think about uh, PDF documents. I mean, there is, there is, we bought out Amy for a reason. One of the biggest consumers of PDF documents everywhere are legal documents, right? So being able to extract all the contract terms, for example, that I've done with all the Fortune 1000 customers, that's a gold mine for me. That is impossible to do today, right? But we could put an army of interns against it, but it's a boring task, but if you deliver, it's a 100x improvement, right? Now, those are the kind of things that we're talking about. Mm. On the application side, you had a graph up there about the predictive old school, I don't say old school, machine you said learning. Old school. I don't say old school. <laughs> machine <laughs> learning is three years old. It's old school. At this pace, one month in, yeah. every month is something massively happening yeah, in AI. It's, it's crazy, so super crazy. exciting. Yeah. But let's just take classic data science, machine learning yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff out there. You put a premise out there that it's application specific in every department. And you had a, your general counsel come out, which we know legal issues with ChatGPT, nice little sub sub message there. Why is these apps so important? What about the apps will be changed? Obviously the toil, the undifferentiated heavy lifting, I get that, but what specifically do you see AI native apps having now that they didn't have before? What are you, what's your vision there on the app space? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, look, the analogy, and I briefly alluded to it, is the database, right? Uh, today, when you're building any sort of enterprise application, it's a given there is a database inside of it. Right, or many databases sometimes. It's going to be the same way with AI, because what is AI at the end of the day? What are we trying to do in the gym? It is distilling the core company's IP, on top of which you build a business process, or on top of which you build a customer interaction, et cetera. So that is why every application in a business is going to use some part of the what makes the company unique, which is their IP. So that's, that's why we see this pattern being repeated over and over again. On your point about the previous generations of models with these generative AI models, right? I mean, AI has served us fantastically well. I mean, you go into any bank, all the fraud detection is done using AI models, right? But there is a model very, very specifically trained for fraud detection. And there is new data that comes along if you decide to add some other dimensions of how you're checking for fraud. It's a whole new model. It is a repetitive, it's, yeah. it's not something that can be built once and reused. Whereas enterprise knowledge can be built and reused. That is where the reusability comes. Raghu, you told the analysts yesterday, and it aligns perfectly with our data, with our partner yeah, ETR, yeah. that 50% of yeah. the customers say they want to do it you know, in public infrastructure, 50% of the activity for generative AI will be done in private infrastructure. You've got the advantage, as you talked about in your keynote, and you brought up your general counsel of the fear, uncertainty, and doubt of legal actions, compliance, and all, all those you know, issues, IP leakage, et cetera. The cloud, the pace of play is very fast. They have the innovation. What do you have to do to ensure that that mix is actually met um, and that the cloud doesn't do what it did before, it's sort of for a period of time, kind of overwhelm the, the sort of traditional incumbents? Yeah, so I want to be important to point out something. This is not a cloud versus on-prem. Mm -hmm. It is, is your AI infrastructure or your AI application depending upon an AI infrastructure that is providing the kind of safeguards you need mm -hmm. in order to avoid those sort of problems. And this could be done by a public cloud provider. It could be done by a standalone company. It could be done by anybody. VMware's unique advantage is we bring to bear two things that I think are collectively put it unique. One is we can take the AI from the model to where, which is in other words, the compute, to where the data is. We are not constrained. We can run in your data center, any which data center you want. 
we can run on your manufacturing shop floor, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, or we can do the training, you can do the training on AWS or somewhere, and you can take the weights, and you can put the run the model in a manufacturing shop floor on top of our platform. So that is very, very unique. The cloud providers today prefer to focus on the large models, which can rightfully so <laughs> be done only in the public cloud. And the second is, we have paid attention to, we are not serving the consumer and the enterprise. We are focused only the enterprise. And so we, right from the get-go, we said we are not going to have a solution that doesn't pass muster with our legal team. In fact, we could not use it internally. When OpenAI, when ChatGPT came around, as you can imagine, everybody started jumping around and started writing code. And our legal team said, no, 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 not so fast. And then instead of stopping there, we said, okay, what do we do to solve this problem? That is where this private AI came about. Yeah, so, so are we going to have a data supply chain problem, like software supply chain? Because what you're saying is yeah, interesting yeah. Yeah, point yeah. because you that have is, to watch the flows. Yeah, that is absolutely parallel, uh, parallels. You can have a prominence of the model, right? What is it that people are worked up about? One of the things that people are worked up about of these large models Legal. is they don't know where it is trained. There is no transparency, right? They do not know where it came from. In all of these open source models, what is it? The, look at the latest uh, Platypus model from Boston yeah. University. Yeah, yeah. They're saying, look, we'll tell you where it was, the data came from, what the model rates, how is it trained, and therefore you feel safe using it. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely, you hit a nail on the head. All right. Provenance well, is going to be an issue. Yeah, I, I'm, we've been double clicking on that, so uh, thanks for that uh, little advice there, and we're going to bring that into the programming. I want to ask you about innovation, because you got legal and compliance threads, you highlighted those in your keynote. The innovation going on, you mentioned Boston University, number one on has a hugging face. Chris Wolf mentioned that as well. Um, the, these models are popping out of nowhere. The exactly. organic in, uh, intoxication of the developer community around this technology is off the charts. They are going crazy um, yeah. around this. It's and fantastic. so you got the bottoms up organic innovation surge, top down board mandates from the boardroom to the dorm room, things are happening. Okay, CEOs are putting a mandate for yep. AI, but the, it stalled, it stopped at this blocker level, you mentioned legal, people are, are, are slowing down a little bit, but it's organically growing. How do you see that being busted down? How do you, what's your, how can you, what would you advise or how do you see it unfolding? Because it's kind of a corporate blocker right now because of the issues got to be architected. So obviously architecture involved, you talk about a system, but you got the surge on the organic growth. Maybe a company comes out and solves the data supply chain problem. That's a new, new company. New brands are going to emerge. So entrepreneurship booming, but corporate is also booming. Do they meet in the middle? <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, this is, I was involved in the early days uh, um, when uh, the web became mainstream because I was working as a product manager at Netscape at the time, right? Same dialogue, right? And by the way, early days of the cloud, people said, hey, uh, you can't do privacy, in, uh, sorry, you can't do security in the cloud, et cetera. But now that problem has been crossed, right. right? So I think it's just a matter of time, number one. Obviously, I'm biased, but we certainly think the solutions that we brought to the table today are exactly one of the yeah. uh, blocker busters, if you will, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, so that's it's why interesting. We're gonna... Yeah, I know you got to go. We're going to end in, in seconds. I know your team's yelling at us, but <laughs> the web, the cloud was horizontally scalable in the cloud. You're saying VMware has a unique opportunity because you're in a way horizontally across environments exactly. where AI can be vertically specialized in the apps where the domain is. Yes. So the, for the first time, there's a visibility into an operating model. Exactly. Is exactly. this the future? The, the internet is now an operating model for the cloud. Yep, 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 definitely. I mean, I think there are a lot of parallels to all these examples that you just cited. And we are in the process of discovering it, right? I mean, we just, let's not forget, chat GPT burst into our consciousness last Thanksgiving or last Christmas yeah. or something, right? So it's very early days. And, and, and your strategy has, in execution have enabled you to be agnostic to the physical exactly. location. Exactly, it fits naturally into what we do best for our customers. Well, I know we got to go. We didn't even mention anything about Broadcom and what's next. I know the next chapter, what you guys laid out today on stage in a great keynote, uh, great surprise to see Jensen up there, kind of like looking at the historic moment of the, what VMware done and congratulations to your team. As you go to the next chapter, as this one closes, a new one will open. What's your final word about this upcoming chapter as you close the, 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 the historic VMware chapter run and open up the next, what's your? What's yeah, your... I'm super optimistic. I think it's going to be exciting. You heard uh, Hawk Tan in the recorded message and in personal conversations, he would tell you the same thing. 
that he's very committed to continuing the tradition of engineering excellence and engineering innovation. He's going to put more money into the business than, quite honestly, we'd be able to do as a, as a private standalone company, and that's one of the rationales for the acquisition. So I'm very optimistic that the combination of those two, the engineering approach and the increased availability of uh, R&D investment is going to result in good things. Raghu, Great. thank you so much for coming on theCUBE and your support. Yep. Really appreciate it. I'm John Furrier. Dave Vellante, he's, he's, a, he's a reader and viewer of Dave's Breaking Analysis. You're yes. a great historic. Thank you for, yep. for doing that. Yeah, There you go. <laughs> thank you so much. Raghu, thank Thanks, you very much. Thank we'll be right back with more yep. live coverage of VMware Explorer after this short break.